was going in the woods. But the thing is, I asked, I asked this guy on the internet, and I was like, well, so a lot of people go to the beach and don't drown, right? But we should still tell them about riptides, because why not, right? So like, it's better to be safe. And I think the, the scariest thing to me is that there would be, be somebody in Chatham County who, who got bit by a tick, then they ended up with some weird symptoms, and they go to the doctor, and the doctor's like, I don't know, you can have any of a thousand diseases. And they never bring up the fact that they got bit by a tick, and the doctor didn't think of it, right? We, so we can't do anything about that second part about the doctor thinking about it, but we'd like to try to do something about the other part. Well, let's make it, well, if you get that get bit by a tick a month ago, huh, okay. So anyway, that's why, that's why I think this is an important meeting. So I won't, I won't belabor it too much, but we do meetings like this once a month, and we're going to start doing them in this space. We've been doing them in the other space downstairs on the small, on the other parking lot for a while now. So we have a meeting in June about um, intellectual property, trademarks, patents, and stuff like that. And we have one in July on uh, cybersecurity from the perspective of an uh, ethical hacker. So somebody who hacks other companies and tries to break in. And then gives them a little report about their crazy system and let them in. Right? So we have those coming up. We'll I'm sure we'll have uh, other ones uh, in the future. So any, any questions? Oh, one more question for me. So how did you how did you hear about this in, in general? So these folks said next door. Anybody read about it on next door? Okay. And uh, chat list. <coughs> chat list. This dice a couple of y'all chat list. Uh, any any other ways you found out? My neighbor's in a <laughs> My neighbor? Okay. Facebook. What? What's that? Facebook. Facebook. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. CP, we're doing all this stuff. Oh, Hopefully, we're getting the message in. So I'm the president. Pete's one of our, our uh, uh, board members. Uh, he's the treasurer. So uh, anyway. Sweeps floors. Yeah. Sweeps floors. Yeah. Okay. So that's all I need. Does that sound good? All right. So you can remember to push record there. Yeah, I already started. All right. Awesome. If you don't mind, I just want to say something real quick. Just everybody started in first. Oh, I just yeah. want to say real quick, I'm Bobby. I'm Yes. Oh, never 
always figure out what you can do to protect yourself. Yeah. Okay? Is that good? Okay. Well, um, that's about all you need to know now. So I'm going <laughs> to... Any of you that know him, I, I met him about eight or nine years ago, and he has this wonderful southern drawl, and he said, you know, when all my peers found out I was coming to Chatham County, they just started laughing, and they said, oh, lady, you're going to Tick Central. And he said, I promise you all, it is not normal how bad the tick situation is here in Chatham County. And did any of y'all know that before you saw Bernie's amazing post? I, I told him he should be my publicist because he did a great job <laughs> promoting the, the talk. Um, so what I want to do tonight is I'm going to give you an overview about ticks, talk about the different kinds in North Carolina that bite humans, talk about the diseases that they carry, talk about how you can protect yourself. And um, we'll just let that roll. I've got about an hour, so hopefully we can uh, cover a lot of ground. So there's nothing, I mean, to me, I feel like the sensation of feeling a tick on your skin is really gross. You know, that creepy, crawly feeling. Um, and okay, you're, this is going to blow your mind, but I actually feel sorry for ticks. <laughs> so they're just trying to do their job. You know, they have a role of ecosystem just like we do. They feed on things and they are fed on. You know, they are a prey and a predator. So, um, however, due to a lot of different circumstances, the population of ticks is way out of control. I'll talk about that a little bit as well. So we know that ticks, can you tell what, what this is? Amber. Amber, yes, Jurassic Park. So they've actually, I found ticks, you know, proven that they have been around as far back as the dinosaurs. And I can't remember which specific era. I want to say Cretaceous, if that means anything. Millions of years, 30 million years. And I've often said that they are so resilient that if we ever had a nuclear war, they would be doing the cucaracha down the road with the cockroaches. It would be ticks and cockroaches. Uh, they are incredibly resilient. So, <laughs> I've got some numbers on this slide here. I'll try to go through them all. <clears throat> there are 899 species of ticks on the planet. And actually, do you all know what, uh, what ticks are? What animal, what kind of animal they're considered? Yes, yeah, so they are in the arachnid family. A lot of people call them insects. They're not insects, they are arachnids. However, the interesting thing is that when they're born, they only have six legs. And they have to feed, and then they molt, and then they have eight legs. So they must have a blood meal to molt to the next stage. <clears throat> uh, here, uh, do you know how many months a year you can get tick bites in North Carolina? Yeah, 12, pretty much year round. You are, uh, you, you have to watch out. And that's the Lone Star tick, which is the one that was mentioned earlier, is most active right now between um, roughly March and October ish. And then that one goes into diapause, goes to sleep for the winter, and that's when the black-legged tick comes out. And that is the one that carries Lyme disease. So when the Lyme star is active, the black-legged tick activity picks up. 
And that's going to vary around the country. You know? What I'm telling you all tonight is specific to North Carolina. And that actually took me a long time to figure out when I got into this field, uh, I kept reading stuff and I was like, that doesn't match what I'm seeing here in North Carolina. And what I realized is at that time, especially seven, eight years ago, pretty much everything online was geared towards the black legged tick, which is the one associated with Lyme disease. And a lot of people will say that is the most dangerous tick in the US. I would um, say, put up your, you know, let's have a duel and discuss uh, the dangers of the black legged tick versus the lone star tick, in my opinion. Um, so, what I'm talking to you about is geared towards North Carolina. So, 12 months a year, four, all four seasons, and then the 5,000 number. That is the number of eggs a tick will lay, three to 5,000. And around here, people call it a tick nest. It's about the size of a blueberry, a little ball of goo. And it's actually, if you, you know, bored one night, um, and you know, if you want to search around on YouTube, you can say, you know, tick, uh, Google tick larva. And it's really disgusting to look at. Um, but yes, the, the lime star tick, especially she'll lay three to 5,000 eggs, and then that's the end of her. So, and it say, uh, people say they stuck in a tick nest. What happens with those larvae is they swarm. And if you're not aware of it, you may go on, you get in your car, and all of a sudden you realize there are little teeny tiny larval ticks all over you. So, something really fun. Okay, yes? So is there, those aren't shiggers, right? That's a different thing? <laughs> Thank you. There's a difference between shiggers and ticks. Yes. Chiggers are another arachnid, and they are mites. So, um, and they're very hard to see as well, but if you can, focus in on them, they're red. And they're pretty much active now for the next few months. The larva will not be around really until August. Uh, late July, August, early September. Every year is a little bit different. You can pretty much count on when the weather turns, you know, we have an 80 degree day, that's when my plan starts running in. Because, you know, the, that's when the Lone Star is getting more active. Um, I also forgot to tell you on the numbers, they've actually found ticks on all seven continents. So, in uh, Antarctica, you would think that would be the one safe place. It's not. Uh, they've found them on birds and in penguin feathers. <laughs> they're, they're everywhere. Okay. I feel like I took this right in the middle of town. Um, Here. Mm -hmm. When I see this, unfortunately, what comes to my mind is tick factories. Mm -hmm. Because all life cycle stages, larva, nymphs, adults of the lone star tick thrive on deer blood. So if you have friends that are feeding the deer, you should say, you might not want to do that because you're bringing the deer and all the ticks is carrying to you. And I feel sorry for them, too. You know, they're like out of control, their population. That was another study that Layton did when he was at the health department. They, they actually went to, um, they went and met with wildlife resources and they said, you know, what can we do to get a handle on the deer population in Chatham County? Because they figured out we have twice as many deer as we should for the area that we have. Okay. And, is pardon? Is there no law I, I think I have some slides to talk about that. Um, the other thing is, I mean, anybody ever hit a deer? 
Like everybody, you know, knows somebody that's hit it here. So uh, they're just honestly, they're public health hazards. <clears throat> I think I had this in here because, you know, I want you to also think about golf courses. You might think that they're a safe place, but actually there's a lot of ticks in the woods right around there. People can actually get bitten on the golf course. The lime star tick, there is, a, so we emit CO2, right? We breathe out CO2. There was a professor at Old Dominion that figured out how to wire an electrode <coughs> to a Lone Star tick so he could gauge its response. Um, because the Lone Star tick, unlike, unlike the black legged tick, which is very passive, it just hangs out and does a thing called questing, waits for people or animals to come by and goes on. The Lone Star tick is a hunter, it's an aggressive. Um, and the, so the doctor, the professor at Old Dominion had wired an electrode to the tick, had a student stand at the end of the hallway, and he was gauging their response from up to 100 feet away. That's a tick. So, I mean, I don't want you to be afraid of going outside, but I want you to be aware because that is something that, that was another piece of information I kept reading. Ticks aren't in the grass, I was like, yes they are. They so should we hold our breath when we walk outside? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I had one guy, and this is where it really started clicking for me. He said he would do, he would be on his gravel driveway underneath his car working on his truck, you know, changing the oil or something. He said, it's not a matter of if, the tick will come. It's a matter of when. I was like, oh yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so this is what we've got going on in North Carolina. <clears throat> the um, let's see. So these, the ones that are bolded, are the ones that are really the highest on the radar. All the others, they do exist, but they're not nearly as prevalent as the others. And again, the main disease for us in North Carolina associated with the black legged tick in the winter is Lyme. But um, alpha gal or lichiosis, spotted fevers, those are the ones that are associated with the Lyme star tick. Okay, um, so I've already told you some of this. The tick pretty much can be found in most of the state, especially in Piedmont and East, and those are the diseases. Um, something that I find int incredibly interesting, people will say tick habitats are expanding because of climate change. And that might be the case for some other ticks. But there was a paper that came out a couple of years ago um, where they wrote about a naturalist journal, and I cannot remember his name right now, but he, in the 1700s, he documented ticks in the United States and up and down the eastern seaboard was the Lone Star Tick. So it was really prevalent in the 1700s. And then there was a massive land change, you know, as we came in and cut the land, and that drew down um, the deer, and it drew down the Lone Star Tick population. So it really was prevalent in the south. But over the last 50 years, that has changed. So now, you know, it's almost as if the Lone Star Tick is reclaiming its, you know, original, we can't say original territory, the territory we knew it had in the 1700s. So, yes? That's kind of scary because that means that even if you got population? Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, that's the fact that you're probably a lot younger about like 
first word not all the way through. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's this, you know, it's a really complicated issue, and this is in academia, academia so um, I don't know how much y'all know from my background, but I have my doctorate in public health, and um, I also teach um, at, at UNC. They have an online mass MPH program. Um, so in academia, we call these problems wicked problems because they have so many different layers, and they're so complicated. And in order to really deal with them, you have to attack them from many different levels. You can't just do one thing and expect the problem. So, yeah. So the deer, yes, they're one piece. Um, okay. So I've got the second part of my presentation is more about about alpha gal syndrome. So I can tell you more about that. Um, I guess, let me ask you first, has any of you ever had a tick-borne disease? Yeah. What have y'all had? I was treated for what they call a lot of body syndrome, um, but also I had alpha gal. Okay. Alpha gal. Okay. Okay. I had, okay, I can't pronounce it from verbal. I'm sorry, but E-H-R-L. Oh, yeah, ehrlichiosis. Yep. So that's what actually, that's pretty much the reason I'm standing here, is I got bitten in 2011. And I mean, when I first got sick, I, I didn't even remember that I had gotten a tick bite. And I just, it was like on a hot day like this. And I just, I felt like death. I felt like I needed to call the ambulance to come get me. It was horrible. I thought maybe I had heat stroke. And I called a friend that was a nurse. She was like, no, you got a tick bite. And so she sent me to the urgent care. Um, we'll talk more about that in, in a little bit. So, <laughs> so the Lyme star tick is the one that's most, in the US, is most commonly associated with alpha gal. Um, and so this is where your question about chiggers comes in because uh, the, you know, you see this picture on the right of all the little bitty bites. Like sometimes people might think those are chiggers, when in fact they're lone star tick larvae. And so it's really hard to tell the difference. Um, you have to kind of piece together what happened. Um, and it's very common with the saliva of the lone star tick is, you know, a lot of people react is very itchy. And um, I've had people tell me that the bite site has you know, stayed for months, maybe years, maybe it went away. If they got another tick bite, maybe the bite site got inflamed again. So um, the other thing that will hopefully be an under of my talk is <clears throat> there's so much we don't know about ticks, about the diseases that they're transmitting. Um, the diseases that are diagnosed in North Carolina don't match the ticks. And so there's been so much attention paid to Lyme disease. And I mean, it, it is a debilitating illness. Um, my mission is to raise awareness about the devastation that is caused across the southern United States of the southern ticks, which, you know, Lone Star Tick, mainly the Lone Star Tick. Um, a lot of times people will say, yeah, my doctor said I have Lyme. Well, this is another one of those things where it doesn't quite make sense. Uh, the Lone Star Tick can actually, you know, induce what they call the erythema migrans, which you mostly uh, hear associated with Lyme disease, and the black-legged tick, which really isn't biting right now, you know, so it's just further confirms the mystery and the difficulties of diagnosing. Um, 
The other piece of the equation now is you may have heard of STARI, which stands for Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. They think that may be another variation of the Borrelia, which is the Lyme Borrelia burgdorferi is the scientific name. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> so it's further complicated here. And doctors, a lot of them just don't even understand all the nuances. I mean, we don't. So, <laughs> okay. So, black like a tick. I've already told you most of these things. The other, yeah, Bartonella is one that's still, um, CDC is still on the, uh, on the fence about some of this stuff, but definitely Babesia um, and some of those other diseases, mostly in the mountains, but they have been found in this area. In fact, the first diagnosed case of Lyme disease in 1983 was by a woman here in Chatham County. So, uh, it's been around for a while. And then the third tick is the American dog tick. So those are the three, really, that you need to watch out for. Just to give you a sense of the proportions, the Lone Star tick is about 98% of the ticks you'll find here in, North, in you know, the Piedmont. A couple you know, 1%, 2% black-legged tick, and then just a teeny tiny bit of dog ticks. And those are decreasing, those have substantially decreased because of people using the protection on their pets. Okay, so that's a key piece in this equation is you know, prevention. I always laugh when I see research that matches what we pretty much know um, I was at a, a tick summit up in Maryland a couple years ago, and one of the student posters was, pet owners are more likely to get tick-borne diseases, right? Because you know, the ticks hitchhike onto your pets, they come inside, and then they go to you. Uh, the, you know, the problem with a lot of the, the tick protection that is used for pets is it doesn't work until the tick actually bites the animal. So if they haven't bitten the animal, or had time for it to take effect, or they sent a human and feel like it's more yummy, you know, like, there's all those caveats, right? Okay. okay. <clears throat> this unfortunately is the reason why we are known as tick control. And so you said Rocky Mountain spot fever a while ago, yeah, so they have um, expanded that. They call it the rickettsias, which are all the rickettsial bacteria, which does include, um, you know, the one most associated with the one you know, commonly called Rocky Mountain Spot Fever. There are also some other rickettsias that are showing up. So here in Chatham, you know, our rate is 14 times the NC state rate and 17 times the U.S. Uh, ehrlichiosis is even worse. <laughs> so our rate here is 22 times the state and 31 times the U.S. So. Um, treatment um, <coughs> of the different diseases. I know alpha gal is not a cure, but for the virus, are they viral? So yes, we will definitely talk about recommendations on what to do. Of course, with the caveat that I'm not a medical doctor. Um, so we don't know about alpha-gal. I actually, there, only until recently was there, you may be familiar with the uh, ICD-10 diagnosis codes, you know, when you go to the doctor and it comes with basketball codes. It was only in 20, well, 21, I think, where they added a diagnosis code for, yeah, for meat allergy, uh, uh, alpha-gal. And 
The other complicating factor is unlike Lyme, rickettsiasis, or rickettsiosis, it is not required to be reported at the state level. So you can see we have just like this convoluted mess of challenges. Yes? Do you know about the Chairman uh, Health Assessment that they do every year or two? Yeah. Do I have Chatham Health? It's, it's, it's called the Chatham, it's by the Chatham Health Alliance, and it's called, I think it's called the Chatham Assessment. Service. Yes, the Chatham Health Assessment. That's Do actually the one that comes out like every three years. Yeah, that's okay. where I got this initial set of data. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is it going to be on this time? Yeah. Do leave it on the survey? And so the one that they're getting ready to do, I am getting engaged in that. Okay. Yes. Right. Awesome. Because we definitely want to ask more questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this one survey found 3%. We just really don't even know. I decided a couple months ago, I was like, I'm just going to ask everybody I know how, you know, for names. <laughs> it's, it's a small area. I know several of you in the room. I put a post on Facebook, and I think that we came up with <coughs> about 250 people, which is way higher than any of these others. Um, you know, whether it's 3%, we don't know. But, so the great news is that there is now a definition that the, it's called, let's see, um, this Council of State and territorial epidemiologists, something like that, Americans. So um, all the epidemiologists in the country got together and they came up with a case definition for alpha gal. So the framework is there. Now, unfortunately, each state legislature has to decide that alpha gal should be reportable. There's one state that has already made it reportable. You'll never guess what state it is. It's New Jersey, which, you know, everybody thinks of alpha gals being in the South if you're aware of where the learning stuff tick is. But um, New Jersey actually has made it reportable. So, so that's one of our, I'm, you know, I run a nonprofit called Tickborne Conditions United, and our three missions are education, research, and advocacy. So advocacy is one of the key pieces of work that we do. And on our, as I was telling you, our to-do list never gets shorter, but on our to-do list is you know, to advocate to our state legislators and say, look, this needs to be a reportable condition. Because you know, it's the whole thing of you've got to know how bad it is to justify the expenses. And you know, it's like this, it's very intertwined. Okay, so this shows you um, the map of the spotted fever groups in Bush Chatham County, right there, right in the center, red. <laughs> for, and that's for the, the spotted fever group. Similar for ehrlichiosis. And that's the incidence, that's the number of people per 100,000. Lyme disease is mainly in the mountains. There certainly are cases in the Piedmont and the coast, but it's most concentrated in the mountains. Okay, so um, we'll talk a little bit more about alpha-gal syndrome. That's a key reason that we actually formed TBCU, is there back in 2017, uh, Congress had required the Federal Department of Health and Human Services to form a tick-borne disease working group. And I only found out about it the day before the meeting. It was up in DC, so I watched it online. And for two whole days, 98% of the conversation was about Lyme. You know, Lyme, Lyme, Lyme. And at the very end of the second day, um, and this is a, you know, an amazing group of people. It's like half public uh, ad 
advocacy experts, educators, and have government employees from across the government. Um, at the end of the second day, the one of the advocates said, what about this alpha gal? I hear it spreading like wildfire. And he said, the chair of the group said, we're gonna table alpha gal because it's not a disease. And at that point I had been, I don't have alpha gal, but at that point I had been involved in the alpha gal online Facebook groups. Um, and I was, and I have a lot of clients with alpha gal. And I was really mad, I was livid. And I went back to the Facebook groups. I said, we've got to start educating them. We've got to get in front of them. So at the next meeting, so they have a meeting every couple of months. At the next meeting, there's a public comment period at the beginning, three minutes, 10 slots, and four of us got slots. And we coordinated our talks. So it was like one, two, three, four. It was like they didn't know I had on them. They really did. There's kind of like later on, I was, they was like, that's what they told me. They're like, we were just kind of going, oh my gosh. <laughs> so we've made a lot of progress since then. Um, and at first, the CDC wouldn't even acknowledge that ticks are the source of alpha gal. Okay, so that's like a whole nother talk about alpha gal and the history of it. Um, but um, uh, there was a paper, they finally did as close to a study to confirm that as they could ethically. You know, you don't want to actually make a tick bite a human and see if it gets alpha gal. Um, but they did a study that was actually centered out of UNC and that led them to agree, yes, ticks are you know, the cause. Alpha gal incidentally is found on uh, in other, I think every other continent as well, except for Antarctica. So there's been reports of alpha gal every, everywhere else associated with different ticks. Okay. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Scott Commons out of UNC. His favorite quote is, Alpha Gal breaks all the rules. And I actually call Alpha Gal Lyme 2.0. So if you know anything about the history of how Lyme disease has been dealt with in the United States, it's, you know, when it first showed up, it's very controversial. Doctors didn't know about it. Um, patients were told their symptoms were in their head. There wasn't a good test. All of these different things. So now all of that's coming around with alpha gal as well. And Dr. Commons will say, alpha gal breaks all the rules. So everything that allergy doctors have been taught about allergies is out the window. So all other allergies known are protein based. Alpha gal is a carbohydrate, it's a sugar. And so, it's in this, you know, so alpha gal's in this weird space, right? It's not quite considered a member of the food allergy community. It's not quite considered until more recently a member of the tick-borne disease community. So that's one of the things we worked really hard to educate. And the big thing is that reactions don't immediately show up. You know, like a peanut allergy. You know, you probably have a peanut. Um, the reaction with alpha gal can they can happen immediately, but that's pretty unusual. It's gonna be a lot more, you know, usually six to eight hours is the most common. Um, yeah, and there are other things too. So there's a lot of different symptoms. Most people know about hives, and they know about um, the anaphylaxis or the GI. Those are the three most common systems that are affected that people will associate with alpha gal. <clears throat> but we've actually been running a survey now for about three years, and I've got a poster in the back that shows some of the results, and we've had 
up to, we're up to almost 3,000 participants. So we've been documenting the, the, the symptoms. And what we've shown is that there are symptoms across all body systems. So it's systemic. And we've worked really hard to document that and to help increase awareness. So um, it's a game changer for some people. Every day is different. You know, you have two people sitting beside each other. One person might just have stomach cramps and the other person may have anaphylaxis. It's never is predictable how um, people are going to react. And in fact, there's been some recent research put out where they're calling it a GI variant, a GI only <coughs> variant of AlphaGal. So, you know, doctors always seem to have some first-time medications that they just can't ever figure out what's wrong with them. And there's a doctor, Sarah McGill, out of UNC, and she thinks, and I agree, that pretty much alpha-gal should be a, included in everybody's lab work mm -hmm. as a standard procedure. And um, because it can, you know, it doesn't show up every time, so somebody might just have, you know, diarrhea or an upset stomach, and that's what it is, but they won't ever know to associate it. Because the symptoms can be super mild. <clears throat> this is something else in our research that we're working really hard to get the word out because pretty much no doctors know this. Um, so you think when you see a test, the higher the score on the test, the worse it is, right? Yeah. So people come back and say, my level was 86 or 500, so you think it's pretty bad. But what we've shown with this is that actually the people that their levels are really, really low, like less than one, can be the most reactive. Those can be the people that are reacting to fumes. <coughs> There's also a relationship with underlying conditions as well. Yes. No, this is a blood test, and it's called IgE, which is you know, a component, and uh, it's your IgE to alpha-gal. So that's how, you know. Uh, is that something that shows up in a regular allergy situation? So most other allergies are diagnosed with, by skin prick, you know, and so that's the other thing about alpha-gal that's different, is you have to get the IgE blood test. Now, mind you, it's $38 test. It should be standard procedure everywhere the lens market is common. Um, so it is a blood test. And you know, the sugar, the IgE, is where they're tracking it, the levels. And that's also another complicating factor. There's until recently, there was only one lab really in the United States that was doing the alpha-gal blood work. Uh, recently, a couple other labs have added it into their menu, so Thermo Fisher does it. But when Thermo Fisher does it, they also do, so they do the IgE, but they also do the beef protein and <coughs> pork protein. So then people, you know, come back and people see their labs and they're like, well, I'm not, a, you know, I don't have the protein allergy, but I have alpha-gal. It's just, it's harder to get the message across about what the problem is because it adds more information and it can be really confusing to people because, um, so my colleague, Dr. Tina Merritt, who is doing a lot of this research with me. And it just so happens that she has alpha-gal. Um, she got it when she was nine. So she had it since the late 70s. And her clinical observation, observation she practices at a clinic in Northwest Arkansas, which is another hot spot. And ironically, happens to be where I grew up. <laughs> so who, go figure. Um, the two 
places I've really lived are very much hot spots uh, for Alpha-Gal. But in her, in her clinical observations, the people that present with the meat allergy uh, is uh, the protein, they do have Alpha-Gal. So it's very unusual, and that's what most allergy doctors will say is you can't have a meat allergy because it's just not known to them. Okay. Yeah, so this is the diagnosis code. Most of the, most of the doctors around here, if you insist, I mean, it depends on the doctor, right? Like, you can convince them to run an alpha-gal blood panel for you. Okay, so this is some information on surveys that have been done in Chatham County, and there was a study, a couple of studies done at the community college and in Farrington. In that study, most people reported either they or somebody in their household had a tick on them within the previous year. Just to give you an idea of the um, the normal number for the U.S. is about 50% of the people will say they had a tick or on their health institute, somebody in their household within the past year. However, the Chatham Health Assessment that Bernie brought up, um, you know, where they did like a statistically a randomized sample of people, their numbers were not as high as 90%. Um, maybe a year or two ago. So it's hard to know really what, what it is. <coughs> but um, <clears throat> most people are using repellents. I'm assuming that you guys you know, use repellents when you go out and do tick checks. But a lot of people don't know which um, conditions are here in Chatham County. Which, which repellents are most effective? Pardon? Which repellents are most effective? Um, it's a good question. So I haven't personally, excuse me, used DEET, but I have a lot of people that spend a lot of time outside that are saying it's not as effective as it used to be. Um, and then, you know, you can look in uh, other you know, online, actually, the, there's a brochure out there, Tick North Carolina, which is a, another nonprofit here. They've got information on their website about all the different repellents. And the EPA has one too. So my other hat that I wear is I have a company called Tick Warriors. We sell eco-friendly tick protection. Um, our repellent is actually, it was created at NC State. They figured out somehow that the wild tomato plant is a really great repellent. And on a two hour window, is as, as effective as DEET or you know, others. Um, I don't know, I would love to know how they decided to look at the wild tomato plant. But, so that's the, you know, that orange bottle over there, that's what we have. I will say that more and more people are using repellent not only on your skin, but also on your clothes. So that's a growing option that people are using. Um, our product works on both. Most products are one or the other. So, you know, the products in general that you can use on your skin, they're gonna be cheap for your clothes. And, and the ones that you use on your clothes, like the permethrin base, um, you don't wanna put those on your skin. So, it's just about what your preferences are and what you wanna do. Okay. So, we talked about how ticks are out of control, deer are out of control, and I've got some slides now about ways that ticks can be controlled. So we've all, you know, have probably a hate-hate relationship with fire ants, but I will say that fire ants love tick larvae. So when somebody calls me up, and they, they're like, hey, I've got all these fire ant mounds, I wanna get rid of them, and I'm like, okay, full, 
disclosure, here's what you need to know. I tell them, unless it's in your path of travel or you have little ones, you know, that you need to be careful, um, I say let the fire ants stay because um, they can help. They're one teeny tiny piece in the puzzles that can help. And I actually started trying to collect some data because I would have some people tell me, I don't have any tick on my property. And then I would have other people, you know, they live half a mile away or a block away and they have a horrendous tick problem. So I'm like, what is going on? Why are there so many ticks here and not here? So I started trying to track. Uh, if somebody tells me that, I'll be like, do you have fire ants? <laughs> you know, tracking information. My little N of one data collection. Okay, so prevention. Somebody was talking about prevention treatment. What do you do? This, you'll see this picture a lot on the internet and it really bugs me because to the maximum extent possible, you should not handle ticks with your bare skin because they are going to vomit stuff onto you and they're going to defecate stuff onto you. Um, you know, of course, if you see a tick on you, you're out in the woods, the first impulse is to grab it, throw it away. Um, I would just ask you to try to find a leaf or, you know, something and, you know, capture it with that so that you're not handling it with your bare skin. And if you have to, then just be sure you wash your hands. <laughs> so, our next impulse is when we see the tick, throw it away, <laughs> right? In the toilet. But what should you really do? Somebody said this a while ago. Squish it. <laughs> <laughs> With something else on your hands. <laughs> so, first, keep, keep going. What should you do when you see a tick? Wipe it or something? Yes. So you should bag it. And, um, you know, write on the bag when you got it, uh, where, and then just stick it in the freezer. Um, and they can actually survive the freezer. So do I. That's one other <laughs> um, You want to have the tip. In our ideal world, you can take the tip to your doctor. The doctor say, hey, this is this tip, and we should cheat. was really fuzzy. I need to call the, the author and ask him um, uh, as far as finding alpha-gal in the larva, Lone Star Tick larva. So I've had so many people say they stepped in a tick nest and then they got, they came down with alpha-gal. You know, shows up usually 
several weeks later, two, three, four weeks later. Um, so that's another one of those things we don't really know the answer to. But if you get a tick, you should definitely save it because you might even forget about it. When I got so sick, I didn't even remember <laughs> that I pulled a tick off me in the middle of the night. It took me on several, I don't even know how long it was before I finally remember. I was like, hey, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and pulling that tick off of me. So, okay. If you don't leave this talk with anything else, I want you to remember this. Dryer. Heat kills. So ticks can survive for 60 plus days that are shown in fresh water, um, but they cannot survive the heat. So a lot of times, you know, if you've been outside, your impulse is to come in and throw your clothes in the washer. Instead, throw them in the dryer, you know, take them all off, throw them in the dryer for 15 minutes on high heat. That's going to kill any ticks that may be on your clothes that you haven't noticed or seen. Okay? That's a great prevention effort that's free. <laughs> so, um, okay. So I want to talk more. Let's see. We've got a, um, a tick kit in the back. I'm going to grab one of those. to grow into your skin and then they inject this numbing saliva. Um, so grab where the tick is at your skin and then you're going to pull straight up. And it takes an eternity, it seems, <laughs> for the tick to you know, come out. And it may have pulled a little bit of skin with it. <laughs> um, but that's what you need to do to remove the ticks. And I actually recommend sharper um, tweezers than that. That's pretty, I mean, these are free, so take them. But if you have sharper tweezers, you want really fine point because you want to get where it's going in to your skin. Now, um, so what to do if you get a tick bite? It's all over the map, right? Um, there are, see, a lot of times the doctors, first of all, it doesn't help to go get tested immediately because it's going to take a while for the antibodies to show up in your blood, okay? And um, so there's that problem. I say it depends on your age and your underlying conditions and your susceptibility. Um, I have several tick-borne diseases. If I get a bite, I am seriously considering getting doxycycline. Now, I want to read you a story about something that happened here in Chatham County last week. <clears throat> um, because a lot of times when somebody gets bitten by a tick, their doctor will not prescribe antibiotics. You know, we have, it's another one of those challenges, right? There's, uh, there's a, a lot of people that feel like antibiotics are overused, but if you actually go dig in, it, the biggest challenge is antibiotics on livestock. It's not treating human diseases. 
but I'm going to tell you the story and why this is so important. Um, <clears throat> okay, on April 26th, patient, 86-year-old male, <clears throat> let me pronounce this right, in reasonably good health, lives in a local retirement community, had what he thought was a new spot of skin cancer. He went to the dermatologist, and the dermatologist pulled off his head. That's how small they can be. Next day, April 27th, patient awoke with terrible vertigo, light sensitivity, and said he felt like he had been in a bad car accident. Went to primary care, they did an EKG, ran blood work. The doctor called the next morning to say that the blood work looked good and the next step was to schedule an MRI because um, to look for evidence of a mini stroke. Next morning, April 29th, um, <laughs> the patient's wife realized it was the tick which had not been mentioned to the primary care doctor, called her daughter, who actually has suffered from severe, untreated Rocky Mountain spotted fever um, and had like a year's worth of neurological symptoms because she had to fight for the antibiotic. Okay. Called her daughter, daughter's like, go to urgent care right now. So uh, they were at urgent care by 9.30. At this point, the patient's presentation, mind you, five days earlier, it was like us, okay? Gray, skin color, using a walker for the first time in his life because he was having such balance and vertigo problems. Now, I want you to know that with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, the most susceptible ages are people that are less than 10 and people that are over 70. So those are the people that are, there's a high morbidity rate. More, yes, high death rate, morbidity, mortality. Okay, so um, healthcare provider agreed to draw a tick panel, but would not prescribe um, antibiotics until the results return. So patient's wife understood the urgency of the need for doxycycline, and she wouldn't leave. The healthcare provider came in four times. Finally, after 90 minutes, agreed to give the patient antibiotics. Okay? Um, so, five days later, uh, so, you know, of course, started taking the doxy that day. <clears throat> Five days later, patient's presentation when my friend reached out to me. Uh, no vertigo, skin color is normal, appetites resumed, his affect, conversational humor was all back. And the Rocky Mountains spy fever test results still had not returned. So if they had waited for the test results, that man would have died. Now, none of y'all may have been around here in the 50s when the UNC football coach, and this is what Dr. Dykers likes to tell everybody that'll listen, you know, he could have gotten a $1.50 doxycycline prescription, but no, he died. So the UNC football coach died. And at that point, they made a concerted effort. I know um, I had a friend who had a a doctor who was trained at UNC probably in the 80s. And um, so they were very good about making sure healthcare providers knew if you have people of that age, you need to treat immediately. And honestly, ehrlichiosis is that way too. I was very lucky. I was able to get um, a you know, person, and that was 10, 11, 12 years ago. I got on Doxy immediately. Yeah, so um, 
Anyway, the patient said, you know, we're certain my dad would have died. And um, in this count, you know, in this area of Rocky Mountain Quad Fever doesn't historically present with spots. And, you know, the, the presentation that doctors have been trained. So I tell you all that because it's so important to advocate for yourself. And when you know, you know, you also, this sound, it may sound, you know, kind of woo-woo, but you know your body. You know if something's not right, and, you know, you have to, like, say, something's not right, I am sick, and we need to get to the bottom of it. So, I actually took that experience, and I wrote a letter to, I happened to have just joined the board of, UNC Health Chatham. Um, so I sent the letter and I urged them to send out a system wide memo to all the doctors and healthcare providers. Um, and I copied a couple of my colleagues at UNC you know, that do infectious diseases, and they said, you know, um, we, we do trainings, but it's just something that really has to be hammered home every time. So, you know, very long answer to your question of what do you do, it's complicated. You know, if you're at a, an at-risk age or have other conditions, you know, you need to make that decision with your doctor. Um, I was very lucky when I got religiosis, which, you know, even being in public health, it, and knowing ticks are bad, I had never heard of it. And my doctor treated me for months. And I remember balking, because I am not an antibiotic <coughs> person. She said, if we don't nip this in the bed now, you can have very you know, long-term problems. Um, so you know, we kept treating until the test came back. And so, ticks, if you get a bite, what should you do? And let's, what other questions can I answer? Yes, Cindy. Did you use alcohol on the tick to help it to release from the skin? So, thank you for that question. So there's, you know, some people say use alcohol or a match or something, but what that's going to do is irritate the tick. And it's going to put more stuff in here. So, um, <laughs> uh, we, you know, one of the things we have is a, a, a spray, it's like a soap, and that basically immobilizes the ticks. And so I use that after I've been out in the field, I wash down with the soap, you know. For me, it's all about what are the multiple prongs that you can do. You know, you can use repellent, you can treat your clothes, you can put your clothes in the dryer, you can do tick checks, you can, you know, wash down with soap at the end of the day. Um, you can spray your yard. A lot of people don't do that around here. Um, you know, culturally, it's not really a practice that has taken off. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do. And for me, what is life if you can't go out and enjoy nature? I mean, we have such a beautiful area and I just want you to know that it is possible you just have to be prudent. Mm -hmm. Yes? When you say spray down like yard or something, is there a natural product that could be used to do that? So there's all, you know, as with everything, there's a whole spectrum of products, right? Our company sells a product that is exempt from EPA standards. Uh, the active ingredient is a soap that immobilizes the tick. There's also uh, a repellent in there. So, you know, we encourage people, especially to spray, if you, most, a lot of people around here have grass right around their house and then a wooded border, mm -hmm. right? And so, really, in my opinion and experience of what I've learned over the last seven years, the best, you know, you really want to spray the border at the minimum to keep the ticks that are there out of your yard. I'm sorry, spray down the border is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I have found to be successful. I mean you can spray the yard.
DR2, but at the minimum, spraying the border. But you've got to have a repellent in it. So not all products do. Some products just kill the pigs that they come into contact with. That's a great start. But remember, the Langstein pit is a different beast. Yeah. What about nematodes? I've read that there's a nematode brought up into, into the lawn that actually consumes the ticks. You know what? I have heard that too. And there was a study that they did up in the Northeast on a product. I don't know if it's on the market still, but that's another one of those things. I think that would be another piece that you can do is spraying for nematodes, which eat the ticks, I think. Yes, they do, they eat them. Yeah, another animal that's good is possums. So possums love ticks. Oh. Pardon? Skittles. 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 Chickens, yes. I mean, I have lots of people say, you know, chickens. Now, that's one of those, uh, there was another study out of Old Dominion, and they, they looked at that, you know, chickens, house yard chickens, and the chickens were actually sources of ticks, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here, um, here, the wild turkeys, lime stars, are, and they love wild turkeys. The wild turkeys are likely to have lone star tits on them for some reason. <laughs> yes, Bernie? Uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was your case. There are kind of like tubes that people say they make with permethrin and cotton and have a tube for something that uh, mice will go and use that as bedding. So, um, what he's talking about there is this uh, permethrin treated cotton that is in tubes, they're called tick tubes. First, and then you put those out in the yard. First of all, the effectiveness of those is only, has in the research literature, has only been shown to be about 50%. Second of all, those are targeted to mice who will go in and get the cotton and then take it to their nest. Mice are not the problem here. Mice are, not a vector for, you know, the ticks. Okay, no. so if I have a can of permethrin, I better just spray my shoes. Spraying your shoes is a great thing. Yes, I have spray right by the door as my son trains. You leave the house, spray. Spray your shoes. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes, do you see a question up here? Hey, Siri, you put tape on your um, Oh yes, that's another great trick. Yeah, it's like you take tape and turn it inside out uh, and tape it across your ankle and you know tape your pants into your shoes and that'll catch any ticks um, you know that are crawling up. So it'll trap the, the ticks. Yeah. Yes. Can bulbs be a vector? What? Bulbs can you say the bulbs? No, are not to my knowledge. Um, so, uh, the small mammals are not really the problem here. Um, and in fact, I had somebody, I was like, having a conversation um, with somebody because the whole thing about the tick tubes, and I was like, you know, I'm working really hard to make sure people have good information to make good decisions. So, I know Holly Gap, who's the current entomologist guru at Old Dominion. What's up? You know, are the tick tubes any use for me? I said, um, and she said, what is happening is, um, you know, small mammals are not carrying ticks, and even like squirrels, if there were to be ticks on the middle sized mammals, that they can't get enough blood from the squirrel to molt. So if you think about that, that makes sense, right? Like, that's why they want deer. Okay, so I have to go teach a class of seven. Um, let me answer your question. Oh, um, just out of curiosity, you had said it might depend on your area, but I haven't had any ticks on me yet, on the dog, but my parents that live down in Manchester Road have not a ton. Is there, are there more ticks this season that you know of, or is it just depending on where you are? 
I think one of the biggest factors is proximity of fear. <coughs> so right now I live in the middle of Pittsburgh, but I have a dog, I've sprayed my yard, and I haven't seen any deer near my yard. And a better knock on some wood, I don't know if this is real, but uh, yeah, so, you know, versus other people who you know, have deer walk through their yard, sleeping in their yard, feeding the deer corn, it should be prohibited. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, you all have asked such great questions. Um, my email address is jennifer at tbcunited.org. So please reach out. Um, there's all kinds of goodies back there. Yes, we'll be.